don't want to pray right now a prayer I've been praying all year. And uh, I'm praying right now in public with you. Father, I ask for more flow of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And I believe right now I receive it for your glory, my joy, and building these people up. I thank you for it. Amen. I've been praying that word for word this year, asking God to give me more flow of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And I ask him that, believing that I receive it. And you could pray that too, anytime you need to. And it kind of goes with what we're going to preach about today from Judges 15, little Old Testament action early in the morning at the champion's breakfast. I tried to do it from John, something nice. I thought we'd do the uh, John 21, the breakfast Jesus had with his disciples, the breakfast of champions. But, and then I thought, well, I can't do this, but it sounds cliche because I want to tell you a little story from the life of Samson. And I thought, well, now that sounds corny. So, you know, I'm preaching at the wrestling thing. Who are you going to preach about? Somebody strong, Samson. Samson would make a wrestling breakfast good sermon. But that's not why I chose it. It was in my daily Bible reading. Another thing I've been doing with my oldest son, Elijah, we've been reading a chapter a day, and then we text each other. He, he started reading the chapter of the Bible a day with his girlfriend. And when he got to about Genesis chapter 18, he came to me and said, Dad, the book of Genesis is getting weird. I said, oh, yeah, that's you didn't know that, but the Bible is not like G-rated, and it's not coloring book stuff when you really read it. He's like, there's this guy sleeping with somebody's sister or wife, or I don't know what's going on. So in an effort to help with that so he didn't get derailed from reading the Bible, um, I jumped in. I said, what chapter are y'all on tonight? And I started texting him uh, and his girlfriend uh, a little verse from each of those chapters. And the, I sent the first one that night and they texted me back like, this is amazing. The Bible makes sense when you explain it. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this again. This is good for my ego. So after a few nights, I made him do one and made her do one. We got a little rotation and we figured out he only wants to read a chapter a day. So it's going to take four years to get through the Bible that way. And currently we're in the book of Judges. So I called it the read the Bible in four years club. And I'm coming out here to see you yesterday, and we're, we're reading about Samson. And I read this story, and the Lord said, somebody needs to hear this story today. So I'm going to share it with you briefly. And y'all pray for me for the miracle of squeezing a four-week series into 15 minutes. Let's go. 1 Samuel 15, verse number... Well, I'm in 1 Samuel. Let me get to Judges. Judges 15. Verse number 14. As he approached Lehi, talking about Samson, the Philistines came toward him shouting. Now, just real quick, how many of you, the enemy has been shouting some stuff at you lately, whether it's in the form of anxiety or telling you you're not going to make it or how exhausted you are? So this is what we're using to represent the things that come at us shouting sometimes, right? And for, for Samson, I feel bad for him because we only know him by his lowest moment when he got a haircut. He gets one haircut, and that's what we define the rest of his life by. Don't you love church people, how we'll just, we'll label somebody with the dumbest thing they ever did? I'll give you an example. There's one disciple we call Doubting Thomas. You ever heard of Doubting Thomas? He doubted one time because he wasn't there when Jesus came back on Resurrection Day. It doesn't say he wasn't there because he didn't believe. He might have been going to get dinner. He might have been DoorDash for the disciples, and he wasn't there. And so he said, I need to see it to believe it. And you would, too, if a dead guy got up from the grave. But he's doubting Thomas. I don't call him that. I call him Honest Thomas because he was like, I'm not, I'm not going to believe unless I see it. And I can relate to that. He didn't want his faith to be a superstition. How would you like, though, for the dumbest decision of your life to define you? And I'm grateful that God doesn't define us like people do. Aren't you? I know it's early, but I need three Pentecostals in the room to say amen somewhere. Is there any Pentecostal person in this room, even if it's in the back? 
I should have brought my Hammond B3 organ player. I should have brought my own tambourine and shook it. Um, Samson did a lot more than get a haircut in Delilah's barbershop. He led the people for 20 years and delivered them from the hands of the Philistines. Now, in this particular passage, he's doing something dumb. This is how dumb it was. His wife, not Delilah, his other wife, he kind of had multiple issues with multiple women. But his wife has been given to another man, so he didn't like that. So he finds 300 foxes, ties their tails together, sets their tails on fire, sets them loose in a grain field. And it ends up where when the Philistines' grain field burns down, the, the wife that he had and the father-in-law that he had both ended up dead. And now the Philistines are mad at Samson and they come to get him and the people of Judah tie him up. And, but how many know that when God has his hand on you, nothing can hold you. When God decides to do something through your life, he doesn't need people to check your resume for it. Many of you are sitting in this room today as a testimony to the grace of God on your life because you weren't that smart. You weren't that skilled. I know what I'm talking about. I came from a town called Monk's Corner, South Carolina. There are more people in my church that I have to pastor today than lived in the town I grew up in. We didn't even get an Applebee's in my town until right before I left for college. So now I have to pastor a ministry knowing that it's only the grace of God. Now that's important to my message, what I want to share with you today, because it says the Philistines came at him shouting, and watch this, the spirit of the Lord, oh, it's up there too. Here we go. Okay. Can y'all see it? Is my big head in the way? All right, just listen to me if you can't see it. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Isn't this a good FCA wrestling scripture? I love this scripture. And look at this. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey. I love how the Bible says this fresh jawbone of a donkey. Like, you can't just have an old jawbone of a donkey to fight the Philistines. You got to have a fresh one because you got a fresh devil. And sometimes you need a fresh word if you're fighting a fresh devil. How many of you have been facing something in your life recently that you never faced before? A season of life, a transition, just nod at me, wink at me, thumbs up like this, do a little secret code under the table. I'll feel the vibration. He had a fresh weapon, but, but it wasn't enough because there's a thousand Philistines coming. But watch what Samson did and watch what God did. It said, finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. That's incredible math. One jawbone of a donkey and a thousand dead Philistines. So Samson, when he saw how good he did, Listen what he said in verse 16. Then Samson said, With a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. Ah, clever. Smart guy. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. That's even got some flow to it. This is like a diss track in the Bible. (laughs) Again, again, again. With a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Samson needed some media training because he's over here in the corner talking about, I did this and I did that and look what I did. And that was amazing. And it was. What he did was incredible. And I think sometimes you don't stop and celebrate stuff enough in your life. Just amazing victories that God gives you. And you're so busy on the next one. Me and Holly were on a hike the other day. We've been hiking an hour. She said, isn't this view amazing? I said, what view? I hadn't even looked. It was beautiful. I was just so like, we got to get there. Why? So we could turn around and walk back. I'll have time to look around. We got to turn around and walk back. I live my life like that sometimes. Not even to just look around and say, look what God did. Somebody say that out loud. Look what God did. Touch the person next to you. They're not contagious, I promise, and say, look what God did. 
Look at them right in their eyes and say, it's a miracle you're here. It's a miracle you're here. You beat the odds. There were times that you thought you wouldn't make it, but you did. Sometimes you got to remind the devil when he comes at you shouting. You know, some of you have been having trouble sleeping at night, been tossing and turning, trying to figure out a few things. Just remind the devil of God's resume and maybe get a little Old Testament on him and say, just like I took the jawbone of a donkey and God delivered me, I didn't have everything I thought I needed, but that didn't stop God. I feel like preaching. I only got about 12 minutes left, but somebody shout, God did that. That breath I just took, God did that. We all ought to appreciate, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. The fact that you just breathed in, the fact that he woke you up, the fact that you're still in your right mind, the fact that you didn't go crazy, the fact that you're at the FCA champions breakfast, listening to the word of God, standing strong, the fact that you're here is the proof that he's with you. And if he did it before... I don't know who this is for, but you grabbed what you had and God did what he does and you made it and you hadn't stopped to thank him lately for that. And it's not because you're not grateful. It's because you're afraid. We all wrestle with this deep down. Do I have what it takes to do it again? Because I've never seen this challenge before. And maybe that's why God brought me here today. Maybe that's why God had Graham say, I want to go to Tulsa. I'm like, you sure you don't mean Tahiti? No, I want to go to Tulsa. And I asked my staff, hey, can I help while I'm there? They said, you could speak at the champion's breakfast. I said, cool, I know what scripture I'll do. And the Lord said, no, you don't. Because you need to speak to somebody who's looking at something that looks like the jawbone of a donkey. I don't know if you're a coach and that's your team I'm speaking of. Looks like the jawbone of a donkey. What I'm saying is, it doesn't look like a big enough instrument for the enemy you've got. Sometimes it's your intellect. You look at how smart everybody else is. They're not smarter than you. They just don't tell you how stupid they are. Ask their wife. Everybody God did something great through was a donkey. In some area, every hero that you see has a hollow place inside. I promise. Promise. Because I've met too many champions now. I've met too many famous people now. I've met some people that we all envy who are secretly miserable. Because they know how to climb, but they don't know how to appreciate. They know how to do stuff there. Everybody in here is heroic in one area and hollow in another. And I think it's great to celebrate what God did. Say it again, God did that. Make a list in your mind, even if it's just small things, that God did this. God did this. Samson doesn't say a single word about God in his song. I made a donkey. Now you are a donkey, dude. Because guess what happens next? He finds out that any victory that God is not at the center of is empty in the end. I promise you. I, I wanted to build a big church so we could reach a lot of people. And God has been amazingly faithful. Amazingly faithful. I never told you this, Carl, but I was an FCA president my senior year of high school. Did you know that? Pastor Mickey White, was, he wanted to be a pastor, but he owned an auto parts store. And so he had a bivocational church. He said, come be my youth minister and be my FCA president. I say, yeah, but Pastor Mickey, there's one problem. One I've only been reading my Bible for a month. And second, doesn't FCA stand for Fellowship of Christian Athletes? He said, yeah. I said, I'm not an athlete. I'm not athletic. I know I look kind of fast. I'm not. I run a 5-4 in the fourth. He said, didn't you wrestle? I said, yeah, in seventh grade. He said, didn't you win a state championship in wrestling? I said, yeah at the freestyle tournament, but I was the only one in the weight class in South Carolina. But I tell Graham, that doesn't stop me. I walk in and be like, South Carolina state champ, let's go. 
but it's empty. I heard nobody. That's true. And seeing what God did, I have to remind myself, I'm nervous talking to you today. All night long, I dreamed that I was wrestling. And I'm like, this is some weird Freudian thing or Jacob with the angel Genesis thing where I'm dreaming about wrestling, but I'm nervous about preaching at wrestling. And why am I nervous? This is what I do. And he didn't even give me enough time to say anything but hello anyway. So I could just say something and sit down. But there was something in me that wanted to help somebody, see? So I have to stand up here in the confidence and remember the times that God came through for me and so do you. And I want you to get better about your God did list. You need a God did list. Just going back to lions and bears that you beat and Philistines that you beat down. You grabbed what you had and God did what he does. And hey, that's good. If you've got bad odds in your life right now, guess what bad, bad odds are? A backdrop for a big God to show off. If he gave you every weapon you needed, you'd start praising the weapons. If he gave Samson a semi-automatic rifle to kill the Philistines, I wouldn't be preaching about it. What made it remarkable is it wasn't enough. And that's what's going to make what God does through you next remarkable. So he can get the glory. So he can get the praise. But when you let it turn to pride, you can't receive what God wants to provide for you. Because after Samson got done with his little donkey song, the donkey remix, after he dropped his donkey track, it said, verse 17, when he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Remeth Lehi. You know what that means, Remeth Lehi? Of course you don't. Why would you? It means jawbone hill. He naming the place out of what he used, like the jawbone did it. That's what we do. We get a victory in our life, and then we're like, oh, yeah, that was because I did it. Then it wasn't that. It wasn't the jawbone. It was Jesus. It was God. It was his grace. He gave me the opportunity. Yes, I had to work hard. No, not anybody could have done it. I'm not taken away from it, but God did that. And he doesn't say a word about God. So watch what happens when he does it. Verse 18, because he was very thirsty. He cried out to the Lord. Killed a thousand men. I guess that will make you thirsty. A thousand men with a donkey's jawbone. That will create our thirst. And there is no better place to preach about dehydration than a room full of wrestlers. I tell you, the Holy Spirit gave me this text, man. I wasn't even trying. And the Lord said, preach about thirsty to people who have literally lusted over ice cubes in their lifetime. Oh, if I could have a fourth ice cube. Because you know what it is to be thirsty. And some of you know what it means to be spiritually dry because you're there right now. Even getting here today, you almost didn't come because you're so busy. I don't have time for that. You don't have time not to. Because if you heap up victory after victory after victory in your life, but God is not at the center of it, Look what Samson said. He said, you have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? And when he said that, something amazing happened. This is what I believe God wants to do in your life this morning. Then, everybody shout, then. Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. We know that in the New Testament, water represents the Holy Spirit. Living waters flow from the inside of everybody who will believe in Jesus and call on his name, and you can do that today. If you've been dry, if you've been desperate, if you're coming here kind of like a hero, like, hey, over here is working, but over here I'm addicted. Over here, it's working, but over here, I'm discouraged. Over here, I'm making it happen, but over here, I'm out of balance. On the outside, nobody sees it, so nobody's checking on me, but God sent a word today 
through your boy Samson to show you that it doesn't matter how many victories you heap up. If it's hollow on the inside, that's the place God wants to fill. That's the place that matters, where you have real peace to know that God is not against me, but he's in it with me, working through me and fighting for me. I need you to make that confession real quick. God, I need to teach y'all call and response. You ready? God is not against me, but he's in it with me. He's working through me and he's fighting for me. See, I thought the reason the water came out of the rock was because Samson cried to the Lord, and he did. He didn't just complain about the lack of water. Oh, I'm thirsty. Where's my water? He called to the Lord, and you and I have to do it too. But it's not just that he prayed that released the water. Watch what he said in verse 18 that's very different than what he did in his little song in verse 16. Because he cried to the Lord, watch this, you have given your servant this great victory. When he put the focus on God, the dry place had to give way. And if you will get the focus off of your mountain, off of your challenge, off of your stress, off of your problem, and remember, I've got a great big God who is sovereign. I have an awesome God. How about you? I have a mighty God. I have a way-making God. I have a Red Sea-splitting God. I have a God who commands angels and tells stones to roll, and they roll. I have a God who takes down nine-foot giants with a single stone. I have a God who knocks down a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. It was God then, and it's God now, and it's Jesus in between. I need His grace. So we came today to shift it from what you can do to what God can do. If you will grab what you have, I know you're in a season like never before. The world is in a season like never before. I know you're doing the math and it doesn't make sense and it doesn't add up and it's not very clear for you right now and you don't even really feel like you fit in at this breakfast maybe because you're like, I'm not one of these good Bible reading Christians and I don't read about Samson in my daily devotion, dude. So get off the stage and let me finish and get on with my life. But God said, I brought you here so I could bring water out of a hollow place. God doesn't want you to be a hollow hero. God doesn't want you to be a person that achieves everything you wanted to achieve but didn't receive what he wanted to give you. If he did it before, he can do it again. Graham, come here. I need some money. Now watch this. He's reaching in his pocket. You think he has money? He has no money. But why he can give me money is right before I walked up, I handed him my sunglasses. I said, keep these while I preach. Don't lose them and keep my wallet because I knew I would come to this moment in this message and I would need an illustration. Give me $100. You think he has $100? He didn't, but the fact that I asked him is the proof that he has it. Because before I brought him to this moment, I put in him what he would need for it. I need another hundred. I'm not gonna tell you how much I keep on you because you might beat me up and I'm scared of this room. Mark, I need you to follow me out of here. Security. And what he can give is not limited to what he came in here with. And neither is it for you. I keep this money till I'm done. Don't you dare take any of it out. I counted all of it before I gave it to you. Watch this, and I'm done. The fact that I asked it is the proof that he has it. God will never put a demand on your life that he will not give you the deposit to fulfill it. And if you're comparing yourself to others, that's your fault because God's going to kill your giants with your jawbone. 
I heard about a lady who needed God to do a miracle. And maybe you do too. Maybe you're in a hollow place today. And maybe you just came for the eggs, but God gave you the bread of life. Because this lady was praying that God would give her some groceries. And she went outside and she was very poor and she didn't have anything to eat. And she started singing a song that she loved from her church. And the song just said, I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Oh, I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Oh, I... How's my singing? Five or ten? Okay. I'm not entering the voice or anything like that. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Be all right. She sang that a few times, and her neighbor heard her, and her neighbor was an atheist, and he got an idea. I'm going to show her how stupid her faith is because he hated God. Don't you love atheists hating the God they don't believe in? That's awesome. So hated God, hated her for believing in God. And so he went to the grocery store. He bought $200 worth of groceries, dropped them off on her doorstep went and hid to watch her respond so he could mock her. And when she saw the groceries, she got happy. She was like, all she could think of to say was, God did it. God did it. God did it. Have you ever had a moment like that where you were praying for joy and God came through? You were praying for a way and he made one? That's all she could say. God did it. Somebody say that. God did it. God did it. And, and she said that. She said that over and over again. And finally, he couldn't take it. He runs out of where he's hiding. He goes to the woman front doorstep and he said, no, he didn't. God didn't buy the groceries. I bought the groceries. I had to show you how stupid your faith is. I bought the groceries. God did it. And she looked back at the atheist and said, God did it. God did it. God, because she knew it was God. And he said, didn't you hear me? God didn't buy the groceries. I bought the groceries. Here's the receipt. And she looked back at him and said, God did it. And he made the devil pay for it. <laughs> That's why I came to Tulsa. To let you know that whatever you're going through, we have a God who is able to do immeasurably more than you ask or imagine. He did it before. He can do it again. Let's give him 30 seconds of praise for what he's doing in your life. Thank you so much. What an honor. God bless you.